Romans chapter 9, we'll be reading verses 9 through 24. Romans chapter 9 and verse 9. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Title of the message tonight, Unconditional Election, Is It Really So? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight, this opportunity we have to study your word. We pray that you would bless in this time, that you would guide and direct. Give us understanding, dear God, we would ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If Calvinists were to vote on their favorite Bible passage, the one that I've just read to you tonight would get an awful lot of votes. They love this text because they believe it teaches their doctrine of unconditional election, the second main point of Calvinism's five points. Unconditional election is an indispensable part of their theological system. I want us to see that and how they define it, and then we'll consider our text tonight as well as uh, other texts that they like to use. Now, we could quite easily make just this one point into a series by itself. That's how much information there is that we could look at. First of all, what is meant by the term unconditional election? W.J. Seaton in the Five Points of Calvinism writes, If man is unable to save himself on account of the fall in Adam being a total fall, and if God alone can save, and if all are not saved, then the conclusion must be that God has not chosen to save all. But Calvinists go further than that. Chapter 3 of the Westminster, Conf Westminster Confession of Faith, section 3, By the decree of God for the manifestation of His glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. Section 7 says, The rest of mankind, God was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of His own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth for the glory of his sovereign power over his create creatures to pass by and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin to the praise of his glorious justice. Uh, Frank Beck writes, We mean therefore by this doctrine that God in eternity chose or picked out of mankind whom he would save for no other reason than his own wise, just, and gracious purpose. Arthur Pink has written, God had a definite reason why he created men, a specific purpose why he created this and that individual. And in view of the eternal destination of his creatures, he purposed either that this one should spend eternity in heaven or that this one should spend eternity in the lake of fire. If there were some of Adam's descendants to whom he purposed not to give faith, it must be because he ordained that they should be damned. 
goes on to write, if God, if then God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, then he must have decreed that vast numbers of human beings should pass out of this world unsaved to suffer eternally in the lake of fire. Protestant Reformed theologian uh, David Engelsma says, Scripture teaches that reprobation is God's sovereign, unconditional decree to damn some sinners. This is the inescapable implication of the biblical doctrine that God has unconditionally chosen some men, not all, unto eternal life. Reprobation asserts that God eternally hates some men, has immutably decreed their damnation, and has determined to withhold from them Christ, grace, faith, and salvation. By the way, one of the leading texts for them getting that to say God, has, God eternally hates some men is the text we will look at tonight. He says, uh, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. I hope that even to hear that really bothers you. I believe it should. Here's more from David Engelsma. He says, reprobation is God's eternal decree that the destiny of certain men shall be everlasting death. Whether one views it as God's passing those men by with the grace of election or as the determination to damn. Now, when it comes to actually proving this doctrine from the Bible, uh, as John Gill says, he says it is spoken of but sparingly in Scripture. In other words, we cannot give you a lot of scriptural support for this doctrine that we hold to. Uh, Calvin wrote in his Institutes, he said, We call predestination God's eternal decree by which he compacted with himself what he willed to become of each man. In other words, you had no choice, you had no say, you have no will in it. God made an eternal decree what your destination would be. For all are not created in equal condition. Rather, eternal life is foreordained for some, eternal damnation for others. Therefore, as any man has been created to one or the other of these ends, we speak of him as predestined to life or death. As Scripture then clearly shows, we say that God once established by His eternal and unchangeable plan, there's nothing you or I can do about it, unchangeable plan, those whom He long before determined once for all to receive into salvation, and those whom, on the other hand, He would devote to destruction. We assert that with respect to the elect, this plan was founded upon His freely given mercy without regard to human worth. But by his just and irreprehensible, incomprehensible judgment, he has barred the door of life to those whom he has given over to damnation. Now, to uh, realize the results of his system of, of predestination to make it all fit together, Calvin believed that God directly ordained the fall of Adam that he decreed in eternity past that that would come about, that he willed that it would come about, Yea, that he wanted it to come about. I freely acknowledge my doctrine to be this. That Adam fell not only by the permission of God, but by his very secret counsel and decree. And that Adam drew all his posterity with himself by his fall into eternal destruction. I at the same time witness as my solemn confession that whatever happened to or befell Adam was so ordained of God. Again, I ask, whence does it happen that Adam's fall irremediably involves so many peoples together with their infant offspring in eternal death unless because it so pleased God? Now, to a Calvinist, unconditional election, a very foundation of his doctrinal position, and it, it becomes uh, all important to him. Uh, George Bishop says the Bible not only teaches the doctrine but makes it prominent. So prominent that you can only get rid of election by getting rid of the Bible. Uh, Lewis Barry Schaefer said the doctrine of election is a cardinal teaching of the scriptures. W.J. Seaton again said the story of the Bible is the story of unconditional election. Herman Hunko said, if any one of the five points of Calvinism is denied, the reformed heritage is completely lost. But it is certain that the truth of unconditional election stands at the foundation of them all. This truth is the touchstone of the Reformed faith. It is the very heart and core of the gospel. Now that is a very strong statement for without the gospel, man cannot be saved. But they believe that the doctrine of unconditional election is at the very heart and core of the gospel. Now, many Calvinists quickly become very unreasonable when this doctrine is examined. Uh, at the end of his treatise on predestination, Calvin states, 
No one will ever attempt to disprove the doctrine which I have set forth herein, but he who may imagine himself to be wiser than the Spirit of God. He said, if you attempt to refute this doctrine, then you must imagine yourself to be wiser than the Spirit of God. Sovereign Grace Baptist Roy Mason said, if unconditional election, predestination, predeterminism are not true, then prophecy is a fake and a fraud. If you reject my doctrine here, then prophecy cannot be true. He also said, if predestination and election are not so, what else? The answer is, then we don't know how everything is going to turn out in the end. Maybe Satan will defeat God and finally win out. If you're going to throw out predestination as they define it, then we have no idea what's going to happen in the end. Maybe Revelation is wrong. Maybe Satan's going to win in the end. Uh, to uh, establish or give credence to the doctrine of predestination, Lorraine Bettner uh, unbelievably says this. When we stop to consider that among non-Christian religions, Mohammedanism, or Islam, if you will, has so many millions who believe in some kind of predestination, that the doctrine of fatalism has been held in some form or other in several heathen countries, and that the mechanistic and deterministic philosophies have exerted such great influences in England, Germany, and America, we see that this doctrine is at least worthy of careful study. So you're appealing to Islam as they, they believe in some form of predestination, so that gives credence to the belief. No, it doesn't matter what Islam believes as, as to what... Uh, as far as establishing the truth. Uh, that does not determine how we see things. This doctrine also sometimes leads to a very cold, uh, very hard, very unevangelistic, very selfish approach to the world. Uh, there was a group called the Particular Baptists. They were very uh, strongly Calvinistic, five-point hyper-Calvinist. Uh, they actually had a hymn that they sung, and here are the lyrics to one of the stanzas. We are the Lord's elected few. Let all the rest be damned. There's room enough in hell for you. We won't have heaven crammed. That's a song they sang. It leads to a very hard, selfish view of the lost out there. And by the way, when you look at it, well, God was pleased to damn them. God wanted to damn them. That's going to exalt God to damn them. Then you stand on the sidelines, and instead of like Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, you say, well, hey, that's great. That'll show God's glory. That'll showcase his justice. And so then you can even end up with songs like that. The teaching of unconditional election becomes a necessity if you believe uh, in total depravity. Total depravity as defined by the Calvinist. Total depravity, which means total inability. That you are dead in trespasses and sins. And so there's, there's no way that uh, you can respond to the gospel until God has regenerated you. God has given you life. And then you can become born again. It's a two-step salvation process, if you will. They equate spiritual death with physical death. And say a physical man can do nothing if he, if he is dead. If he's physically dead, he can do nothing. And so a spiritual man can of necessity then do nothing. The, the logical answer to that is, well, a, a physical man, a physically dead man cannot even sin. And so then a spiritually dead man should not even be able to sin. So obviously the two do not equate uh, in, a, in a perfect correlation there. But uh, the connection of this second point of unconditional election with the first point of total depravity as defined by the Calvinist, uh, as explained by Lorraine Bettner, he said, if the doctrine of total inability, total depravity in other words, or original sin be admitted, the doctrine of unconditional election follows by the most inescapable logic. If, as the scriptures and experience tell us, all men are by nature in a state of guilt and depravity from which they are wholly unable to deliver themselves, have no claim whatever on God for deliverance, it follows that if any are saved, God must choose out those who shall be the objects of his grace. Having given you all of that as the foundation for our study tonight, let us look at our text. And in order to determine, uh, to see if it is teaching what the Calvinists say it is teaching. In Romans chapter 9 again, in verse 9, says, For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. 
As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. I want us to look carefully at each of these illustrations or examples that Paul uses. Uh, he talks about Jacob and Esau. He talks about Pharaoh and he talks about the potter. We'll consider them in the order they're given. We'll not have time to go through all of them tonight. Notice in verse 13 that Paul is quoting from another scripture. Specifically, he is quoting from Malachi. This, the statement, it is written, uh, this statement that is written is nowhere else in the Bible. Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. In the preceding verses, he is, uh, he is referencing a passage from Genesis. Both of those references are important to help in understanding this passage tonight. Turn, if you will, to the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, we'll read the first five verses. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Look at chapter 3 and verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now notice in the book of Malachi, we are dealing with something national, not personal. Very, very important, and we'll establish that as we go through the Old Testament tonight. When Jacob is referred to, we are talking about Israel. When, when Esau is referred to, we are talking about Edom. I want you to see that throughout the Old Testament. I want you to make the connection uh, in all of this. Uh, you'll need to turn to a number of scriptures for our Bible study tonight. If you turn back to Genesis, and we'll go ahead and walk forward through the Old Testament so you can see that and, and be able to biblically establish that point. Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 30. And we're not going to have the time to go through all of these stories and really build on them. You can do that in your own personal study. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 30. And so we won't give the background for this. We'll just go right to the verse. Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Look at the last phrase there. Therefore was his name called Edom. Now turn to chapter 35. Chapter 35, verses 10 and 11. God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Okay, so we have two individuals, two brothers, twins in our story. Their names are Jacob and Esau. Their names would be changed eventually as they would each head up a nation. Jacob would come to be known as Israel for the most part. And Esau would come to be known as Edom. God would use that because each of these brothers are going to head up a nation, a race of people. Jacob would come to represent Esau, or Israel. Esau would come to represent Edom. Now turn back to chapter 25 again of Genesis. 
Genesis chapter 25 and verse 21. Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived, and the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now watch the progression. Turn to chapter 27, verse 41. Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. Again, we're not going to be able to go through each of these stories that represents uh, what we're getting at. But you can take the time to read it on your own. Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. What started out as a personal hatred eventually became a national hatred. Now, notice where Esau dwelt. Turn to chapter 32. Chapter 32 and verse 3. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, S-E-I-R, the country of Edom. Now turn to chapter 36. Genesis chapter 36 and verse 8. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Are you having it again? S-E-I-R. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. Seer. You following along okay so far? Okay, turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Be reading verses 14 through 21. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border." Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway. And if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people, with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him. What started out as a personal hatred has now become a well-established national hatred. Now, in chapter 24, Balaam gave an interesting prophecy. If you turn to Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Numbers 24, verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth, and Edom shall be a possession. Seir, where Edom is, is that where the Edomites live, also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Look at the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, God gave 
an interesting and gracious command concerning Edom. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Now, eventually, God would pronounce his hatred or his judgment on Edom. And eventually, because of the fact that they continually fought against Israel, and so God continually fought against them, people would say, well, hey, here are, here are the people against whom God hath indignation forever. But I want you to notice it did not start out that way. God said, listen, don't you abhor an Edomite. He's really your brother. And so uh, you're to respond to him graciously. You're to respond to him charitably. Now turn, if you will, to the book of Joshua. As we're going through this, there, there might be some loose ends, that, uh, but don't worry, we'll try to tie them all together before we're done tonight, and hopefully all of this will come together and, and make sense for you. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 4. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. I gave unto Esau, Mount Seir, to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. And in 1 Kings, well, I'll take the time to go there, but we see where Hadad, the Edomite, was an adversary to Solomon. Here again, you find an Edomite uh, coming against the Israelites to try to uh, attack them and harass them. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, it says, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, verse 10, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Verse 22, And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. And here again, we see the Edomites coming out against Israel. In reference to Jehoram, chapter 21, and verse 8, we read this. In his days, the Edomites revolted from under the dom dominion of Judah and made themselves a king. So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day, verse 10. And then again, 2 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 20, we'll read one verse there, Amaziah would not hear, for it came of God that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies, because they sought after the gods of Edom. So we find that the Edomites were a problem for the children of Israel. Uh, they would not allow them to go through the land. They came out to battle against them. They fought against them. They tried to overthrow them. And then eventually, even the gods of the Edomites became a snare to the children of Israel. So Edom caused uh, no end of problems and grief to the Israelites. In Psalm 83, verse 1, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee, the tabernacle of Edom and the Ishmaelites. They said, come, let us cut them off. Let's destroy them. Let's keep them from being a nation. They've taken counsel against your people, tried to overthrow them. They're confederate against thee. These were the Edomites in, in confederation with the Ishmaelites and the Moabites to try to destroy the nation of Israel. In Psalm 137 and verse 7, we read, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. Now the word raise, not R-A-I-S-E, but R-A-S-E. In other words, destroy it, demolish it, take it down to nothing. 
And so the psalmist is saying, Lord, would you remember the Edomites? Would you remember what they said against Jerusalem when they said, raise it or destroy it even down to the foundation? Let's utterly wipe them out. Let's completely destroy them. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 49, God promised judgment upon Edom. Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 15 through 17. We read this. For lo, I will make thee small among the heathen and despised among men. Thy terribleness hath deceived thee. The pride of thine heart, O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Also Edom shall be a desolation. Every one that goeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. Because of their pride, they lifted themselves up in pride and they had tried to destroy the nation of Israel. In Obadiah, God expands upon this pronouncement of judgment upon Edom. Obadiah, the third verse, he says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. You've stood in opposition to my people. You've exalted yourself in pride. You've said, nobody's going to conquer me. Nobody's going to bring me down. And God says, no, you're wrong, Edom. I'm going to bring you down. Verse 6, how are the things of Esau searched out? Remember, Edom is the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. Esau and Edom, interchangeable. He's pronouncing judgment upon Edom. He says, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Verse 8, shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, understanding out of the mount of Esau? Thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob. Shame shall cover thee and thou shalt be cut off forever. Why would God judge them? Why would God bring this condemnation upon them? For thy violence against thy brother Jacob. Verse 11. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side. In the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces. And foreigners entered into his gates. Cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou wast as one of them. God had told Israel, he said, listen, deal charitably with the Edomites. They're your brothers. But the Edomites did not return the favor. He said, in the day when the enemies of God's people came into the land to carry them captive, you stood on the sidelines and you were as one of the enemies. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. So listen, you stood on the sidelines and you rejoiced when the enemies of God's people came in and ravished the land. You rejoiced and you said, destroy the city, knock it down to the foundations. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. You came in and looted and spoiled. You should not have done it. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity. Nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. He says, Edom, I want you to understand that the judgment of God is going to fall upon you because of what you've done to my people. You entered into the city. You destroyed the city. You ravished and pillaged and looted the city. And he's your brother. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway. Now listen to this. To cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. There shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. 
The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. They shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. God says, I want you to understand why judgment's coming. You stood by in the day when Israel was ravished. You stood by when Jacob was being overrun by the enemies. And you cheered. You applauded. You were happy. Then you entered into the city. And you took the spoil of the city. And then you stood in the crossways. And you opposed anybody trying to flee for their lives out of the city. And then you took captives. And turned them over to the enemy. That they might be persecuted and killed. So Edom, Esau, you're now going to be judged. What you did to Israel is going to be done to you. Lamentations also talks about the enemies of God's people rejoicing over the destruction of Jerusalem. One of those enemies was Edom. Lamentations 4, 21. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom that dwelleth in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. So God says, because of what you've done, you've rejoiced because of what happened to Jacob. And now you need to know, Esau, that what happened to Jacob is going to come back upon you because you rejoiced. In her judgment. Ezekiel chapter 25 and verse 12. We read this. Thus saith the Lord. Because that Edom hath dwelt against. Hath dealt against the house of Judah. By taking vengeance. And hath greatly offended. And revenged himself upon them. Therefore thus saith the Lord God. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom. Will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. They shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. Again, God explains why judgment's going to fall upon Edom. Turn, if you will, to Ezekiel. If you're not there yet, turn to Ezekiel chapter 35. Ezekiel chapter 35. And while you're turning there, I want to read to you from Amos. Amos chapter 1 and verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because he did pursue his brother with the sword, did cast off all pity. His anger did tear perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. God says for three transgressions and for four of Edom or Esau. He says, I'm going to send judgment. You didn't have any pity and you pursued them with the sword. And, and he says, eventually, he said, you kept your wrath forever. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 35. Ezekiel chapter 35 and verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir. What was Seir? Where the Edomites dwell. That's the home of the Edomites. Seir was given to the Edomites. Seir was given to Esau and his descendants. So he's saying, son of man, you're going to prophesy a judgment against Mount Seir, where the Edomites dwell. He said, uh, son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, prophesy against it, say unto it, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Now, we're going to see this again. We saw it in Malachi. We'll go back there eventually where he's talking about laying his mountains and his, his uh, uh, places of habitation. He's going to lay them desolate. We're talking about a national prophecy given against the race of people. Verse 5. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred. That's what he said in, in Amos. You've been angry. You've been perpetually uh, ra wrathful against them forever. And God says you've had a perpetual and ongoing, unremittent, unrelenting hatred against the Israelites. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, God says, because of this, 
this. Because you've done this to them, I'm going to do this to you. Therefore, because of, verse 6, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood. Blood shall pursue thee. Sith, that old English word meaning since, that's the only place in the Bible it's used, by the way. Sith, thou hast not hated blood. Even blood shall pursue, you, pursue thee. He said, you've loved blood. You've loved to shed everybody else's blood. So now you're going to get your own blood shed. Thus will I make Mount Seir, most desolate, cut off from it, him that passeth out and him that returneth. I will fill his mountains with his slain men. In thy hills and in thy valleys and in all thy rivers shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I will make thee perpetual desolations and thy cities shall not return. Ye shall know that I am the Lord. Because thou hast said... These two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. The Edomites said, hey, you know what? We're going to possess our own nation, and we're going to possess the land of Israel as well. Demolish it, knock it down to uh, the foundation. We're going to take them both. We're going to overrun them. We're going to subdue them. Verse 11, therefore, because of, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, they are laid desolate. They are given us to consume. They kept saying, hey, knock it down to the foundation, lay it desolate. It's going to be ours. Just wipe them all out. Verse 13, thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. By the way, God hears everything we say. And God says, listen, I've heard what you've said against Israel. I've heard what you've said you're going to do against Israel. I've seen you rejoice to shed blood against Israel. So what you've pronounced upon them, God says, I'm going to pronounce upon you. Verse 14, thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. As thou didst rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Idumea, even all of it. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Now turn, if you will, back to Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. Again, verse 1. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Why would people call them that? Why could they? Why would they? Because they had a perpetual hatred against Israel, Ezekiel tells us. Therefore, they would suffer the ongoing judgment of God. You remember way back in Genesis 12, when God appeared to Abraham, what did he say? What did he say in regards to how we a people or nations treated the land of Israel? Those that would be a blessing to Israel, God would bless. Those that would be a curse to Israel, God would curse. Edom became the living fulfillment example of that prophecy. As they came against Israel with everything they had. And God said, okay, as you've done to them, I'm going to do to you. If you would have blessed Israel, I would have blessed you. Since you cursed Israel, I'm going to curse Israel. You. It's clear why they suffered the judgment of God. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. So listen, you mess with Israel. And by the way, I believe that's one of the reasons why America still stands today. Listen, you mark it down the day America turns against Israel. We're done. I believe that's one of the things, one of the few things holding back the judgment of God. America deserves to be judged tonight. But we still stand as a friend to Israel sometimes. We're not a great friend, but we're a good friend. And, and God said, listen, if you touch them, you've touched the apple of my eye. You mess with them, you're messing with me. And I'll judge you. I'll chasten you for it. In none of those passages do we see God saying, 
Esau, Edom, I have predestined you. I have foreordained you, elected you to eternal torments. And you must go to hell because I decreed it in eternity past. The Calvinist, I believe, makes a number of serious errors when he comes to Romans chapter 9 as he does with other passages. Now, before we go back to Romans 9, I want us to consider uh, one more important point. And don't worry, we won't cover all of Romans 9 tonight, so don't panic. We'll, we'll get to that a subsequent week. Genesis chapter 29, verse 30. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Jacob, the Bible says, that he loved Rachel more than Leah. And so it says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, I mean, she was loved less. Here it is used, used as a contrast word. Leah was loved less, and so it says she was hated. Matthew chapter 6, 24, verse 24. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And there we see it again. You're going to prefer one or the other. You're going to love one less. And so, by contrast, he talks about... Uh, the, the one master will be hated. He will be loved less. Leah was loved less. So it says she was hated. It's used as a contrast word. Not in the sense that we would use the word hated. Luke chapter 14 verse 26. Jesus said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters. Yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. Obviously that cannot mean hate like, the, like we would use the word hate. What sense would that make? Jesus says, listen, if you're going to come after me, you've got to hate your wife and your father and your mother and your children. What kind of testimony would that be to a lost world? If we hated them in the sense that we would normally use the word hate. God is saying you must love them less. It's a contrast word. You must love them less. If you're going to follow me, you've got to love me more. And by the way, that's still true tonight. If you're going to really truly follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to love him more than anybody else. Your love for him is to be supreme. You're to love him with all your heart. And so Jesus says, look, if you're going to come after me, you've got to hate your father, mother, brother, sister. He, he, he's using it in the sense of a contrast. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Love yourself less. Deny yourself if you're going to follow me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's where you get, again, the contrast. You're talking about loving God the most. Loving your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your wife less. That's what it means when it's using the word hate. It's a word of contrast. If you're truly going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, your love for him must be supreme. That's what he's teaching. Now, go back to Romans 9. We'll look at a number of errors that Calvinists make. We'll wrap this whole thing up tonight. Romans chapter 9 and verse 9. You following along okay? I'm not losing you? Okay, I don't want to lose you with this. I want you to, I want you to get this. Romans chapter 9, verse 9. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Now, error number one, this is not talking about salvation. This is not talking about salvation. You make, an, you make a mistake in your interpretation of this passage when you take it to be talking about salvation. There is no reference in Malachi or here or in any of the passages uh, we read that teach that Jacob or Esau or any of their descendants were predestined for salvation or damnation. 
Service and position are in view here, not salvation. You've got to understand that. You've got to interpret this in context or you're going to take a left turn and you're going to end up some strange place with your doctrine. He's not talking about salvation here. Dick Sanford writes, circle that word serve. It's not saying the elder shall be saved and the younger shall not be. Never mix the scripture that is talking about service with scripture that is talking about salvation. Service includes works that are rewarded. Salvation is grace apart from works. Here the Lord says that before they were ever born, he knew which one was going to be born first. And I'm going to switch this service pattern. And the inheritance is going to come through the younger instead of the older. That is a reversal, reversal also. Notice, now it does not say, Jacob have I saved for heaven and Esau can't go to heaven. But I told you that the blessing is not going to come through Esau. The children of Esau are not going to lead up to the Messiah. It's the children of Jacob that are going to lead up. To the Messiah. We're not talking here about salvation. Jesus said, They hated me without a cause. That's what Jesus said. Now, wait a minute. If unconditional election is true, if God unconditionally elected some to salvation, well, certainly they'd love him. But if God unconditionally elected some to eternal damnation, they had no choice in it. They could, not, they could not get saved if they wanted to. God unconditionally elected them, predestined them to hell. The ones that were consigned to hell before they were even born, could not it be said that they had a cause for hating the Lord? How could you say they hated me without a cause if you foreordained them, predestined them to hell, and they can't get out, there's no escape in it? No, Jesus said they hated me without a cause because he came to die, shed his blood, the ransom for all of mankind. And man chooses to walk away from that. God did not foreordain them. They had to go to hell. They had no choice in the matter. Error number two. This is not talking about individuals. Listen, Esau never served his brother during their lifetimes. Esau didn't serve his brother. If this is in view, it's a false prophecy. Jacob bowed down to Esau. Jacob called Esau Lord. Jacob claimed to be Esau's servant. Jacob urged gifts upon Esau. Going back to Genesis, we read, The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two manners of people shall be separated from thy bowels. This goes far beyond two individuals. Two nations are in thy womb. The one people shall be stronger than the other people. The elder shall serve the younger. Jacob did not have the mastery over Esau. Nor was he stronger during their individual lives. This is dealing with two nations. And the blessing that would come was not to an individual. It was through that lineage, through the line of Israel, not Esau. Edom, which had turned against Israel, which had turned against the nation, which had persecuted them. They would not enjoy the blessing of God because they were predestined to that. No, because they had turned against Israel. They had fought against him. They had fought, in essence, against God as well. It's important also to note that not every descendant from Jacob was saved. Far from it. If we're talking election to heaven, a lot of them missed out on it. Not every descendant of Jacob was saved. Nor was every descendant from Esau lost. Romans 9 does not prove in any way what the Calvinist wants it to prove. Error number three. Misunderstanding the cause and meaning of God's hatred. When it says in verse 13, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It doesn't mean that God despised Esau. Not originally. He may have later on because of what Esau did, but not before he was born. It wasn't as if God had said, well, listen, uh, you don't have any choice about it. Before you were born, I hated you. You were going to die and go to hell all along because I hated you. Uh, no, you know, you know that's not what it's saying. Early on, God said, listen, you, you, deal, you, deal, you deal graciously with Edom. He's your brother. Deal with him in a, in a good manner. 
But then as Edom kept coming back and persecuting God's people, kept, kept going after them, trying to wipe them out, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis 12 came into view. God said, listen, I'm going to fight against you because you fought against my people. You're going to be destroyed. You haven't blessed Israel. You've cursed him, and so you're going to get a curse. You've laughed at his destruction. You've enjoyed shedding blood. So I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to shed your blood. You're going to reap what you've sown. You're going to get back on you what you gave out. If you read the Bible, you know that God doesn't despise little unborn babies. He's not talking about dis being despiteful and, and preferring this baby. And so this baby gets to go to heaven and, and hating this baby. So this baby has to go to hell. Not at all. After Edom had done all she had done to Israel, God said he was going to judge her. After she had attacked Israel, after she had rejoiced in Israel's destruction, then she suffered God's judgment. Before Edom turned on Israel, any, any mention or manifestation of hate must of necessity be in the sense of not preferring, loving less, etc. Uh, used, in other words, in a comparative way. Error number four. Reading eternal decrees of election and reprobation into this passage. Clearly, this passage is not talking about some decrees uh, from before the foundation of the world in regards to people's destinies as Calvinists like to assume. Because the Calvinists are so eager to find unconditional election to salvation and damnation here, they miss or they gloss over the messianic implications and thoughts in this passage. Any election in view here is in the line uh, of the ancestry of the Messiah. Romans chapter 9 and verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And by the way, Paul would be wrong to wish that if God wanted those people to go to hell. If God had decreed them going to hell and God's going to take great pleasure and joy and uh, honor in them going to hell. Here, why is Paul here working against what God wants? For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my, my brethren. Paul said, I'd be willing to go to hell if I could save my, my kinfolk, my brethren, according to the flesh, if they would get saved. Verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, whose are the fathers, and as whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. The true Israelites, the ones that were true followers of God. There's a difference there. Verse 7, neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Not just the physical lineage. You had it go through Esau and Jacob. In one sense, you could say they were all the children of Abraham. God's saying, I'm not just talking about a physical lineage. Verse 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time will I come. Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. There are those from the line of Esau that have gotten saved. There are clearly many from the line of Jacob that have died lost. But out of the line of Jacob, the Messiah came. Not from Esau. So he's saying before they were ever born, the purpose of God was established that out of the line of Jacob, the Messiah would come that would redeem those that would turn to God. He was not saying Jacob will go to heaven and all of his descendants. Esau will go to hell and all of his descendants. Not at all. That's not what we're talking about here. And when you try to read that into it, you end up having to twist the scripture. You miss the whole messianic implications of it. The prophecy that out of Jacob would come the Redeemer. So rejoice tonight, Christian. Your God desires the salvation of all men. That's why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the
the Greek. Jew first, God's chosen covenant people that he wanted to work through to take the light of the gospel to the world. But they missed it. But those from the line of Edom, the good news tonight is you can be saved just like those from the line of Jacob, just like everybody else in the world. It is the power of God, the salvation to everyone that believeth. That's the determining factor. Not to everyone that is the elect chosen by God in eternity past. No, it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Thank God for that. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would take these words and use them. Help us to understand your word, to interpret it correctly. We pray that you'd bless this invitation time now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you quietly stand to your feet as our altar workers come, our musicians begin to play. I realize it's not been a salvation message, but if you're here tonight, you're not saved. Maybe you have some questions. You want to talk with somebody about salvation. The good news for you tonight is that God says, whosoever will may come.